Welcome into Overdrive on this beautiful Monday afternoon in the city of Toronto. I am Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes all week long with my friends Frank Corrado and Jamie Noodles McLennan. How we doing, fellas? What's going on? All good. All good over here. Noodles, how you yeah. feeling after that marathon on Friday? <laughs> all good. I'm, yeah? I'm good. I mean, it, yeah, it was a bit of a marathon, a bit of a sprint, really. Uh, you know, you're calling a game in L.A. on Thursday night, and then you're chasing the plane down, and then you're getting on the plane and uh, landing and hitting Trade Center. But it was good. You know, it was, I wish there was more. I don't know how you guys felt, but I wish there was more of the trades that leading up to the deadline that were saved for Friday because, you know, you guys felt that we, we were looking back instead of looking forward pretty much on Friday. I don't know how you guys felt. So I am a complete moron in that I (laughs) took a vacation over trade center. I was in Tampa over the weekend, saw John Tortorella get kicked out with my own two eyes noodles. That was awesome. (laughs) it It was something to behold. But I walk into our boss, Jeff McDonald's office today. He's like, did you have to take Trade Center off? And I'm like, listen, Jeff, I'm not the smartest individual. This is not exactly breaking news here. But probably should have stuck around my place of work on one of the biggest days of the year. Would you guys not agree? You were busy teeing agree. it, man. You were busy. <laughs> you had very urgently had yeah. to tee it. Yes, I, I did. I don't know how you didn't. Like, you didn't put two and two together leading no. up to it. You're like, yeah, Friday will be Trade Center. I, I'll, <laughs> actually, I'll be in Tampa. I have a good one with that. Like, like you did, did at what point, like, be honest, at what point did you go, I'm going to miss Trade Center? It was probably the week prior. And by that point, you had the flights booked. You yeah, had the rounds of golf booked. Yeah, you know, you're done. We had you're the, done. Uh, the tickets purchased for Leafs or the Leafs Lightning. For Lightning Flyers, you're like, all right, well, I'm pot committed here, and this is what it is. But I was following along. I was on the golf course. I'm watching all the festivities. You noodles, along with Brian, who's down in Florida himself, welcoming, yeah. uh, ushering the O-Dog into uh, Trade Center, which I thought was uh, an absolute incredible spectacle. And I will say, like, when you're on the golf course and refreshing Twitter and all the apps on TSN.ca, the updates, it's not necessarily the ideal situation. But you're you're spot on when you say that a lot of the deals were already consummated. Like, really, the day of the deadline was pretty quiet, but the week leading up to the deadline was anything but. Well, yeah. and, and, you know, one of the biggest deals was Jake Gensel going to Carolina, and Carolina lays a beat down on Calgary yesterday, Oof. and Kuznetsov... Like, he looks like he's a guy who's found, it's like he's found a purpose again, Noodles. It's like yeah. this guy, you put him in that situation. And I heard uh, Justin Williams was a big reason why he was he was going there. Obviously, he's in the front office in Carolina. They would have played together in Washington. But I don't know. Like, that's one of the teams that probably got a little scarier in the East is Carolina. Yeah, I circled them. There was three moves there because Freddie came back healthy. That was kind of under the radar, right? So Freddie Anderson... You know, he handed one away to Calgary to Sharon Govich there. But outside of that, like, I thought he looked pretty solid. So you got Freddie coming back because all we've been talking about all season long with about five organizations going, man, if they had a goaltender, you know, if they had this. Like, so Carolina already had a deep defensive core. Then you add two, you know, really good scores, two really good high-end quality skill guys up front. And then for free, you've added a goaltender who can be a number one who has played in the playoffs, but just obviously has had injury issues and the blood clots. But they've got three, they got better by three players at the deadline and two they traded for. Actually, I mean, Kuznetsov was kind of free in essence. You, you, you didn't yeah. pay much for him as pennies on the dollar, but they're, they're a better team today than they were last week. What I really think is interesting when you compare and contrast the Eastern Conference and the Western Conference, like the top teams in the West, of course, Edmonton making significant moves, Winnipeg, Colorado, Vancouver, Vegas, it goes on and on and on. While in the East, it was a lot more muted. I think, or maybe probably Carolina would have the most significance with Gensel, with Kuznetsov, Florida trades for Tarasenko. Rangers brought in Wenberg. They brought in a depth defenseman in Ruedel. Yeah, but compared to the West, where, and I think it's almost like a a relativity thing, right? Where the teams at West are looking at their competition being like, oh my God, like we need to do something. If Vegas is going to go out and get Hannafin, we need to try to counter that move or at least make some kind of comparable transaction. In the East, it was... A lot more, all right, like let's make maybe moves a little bit more on the periphery as opposed yeah. to the yeah. all-in approach that so many teams out West had. Well, look at look at the West right now. Like you, you look at the standings every day, 
and you try and figure out who's going to have to go through who here in the first round. Because, like, the first round, it, it feels like in the West Noodles, is going to be the hardest. Just yep. because you're going to get a team that's fresh and ready, um, that's very good. And then, you know, as the the kind of war of attrition goes on, like, you'll you'll see guys are going to play banged up. Teams are going to, you know, they're, they may not find their game. Maybe a goaltender isn't hot, but... I don't know. Those those first round matchups in the West are not desirable. Like if you're Vancouver and you're sitting there at 91 points and you got to play Vegas in the first round, like good luck with that, man. There's there's no gimmies there. No, I the only one that so Minnesota, I don't know if you guys saw this. They pulled the goalie yesterday with the yes. extra point, like yes. chasing it. I thought it was a pretty, you know, pretty crafty move. Yeah, I mean, it, it could have backfired, but it worked for them. So in looking at it, there's there's two things standing out for the West for me. You're right, Edmonton kind of, you know, tried to add a little bit of size and some depth to them, but the news of Demko's knee injury concerns me because you look at Vancouver's ten points up on Edmonton. Edmonton's got three games in hand, and they play each other once. So, you know, is Casey DeSmith going to be able to hold the fort for the next two to four weeks with Vancouver? And Vancouver's a hell of a team. They've had a great season. But this is real adversity. This is a star player getting hurt at the wrong time. Because, you know, even leading up to the last six weeks of the season, you want your players playing at the top, playing, you know, the best of their abilities. Now, Demko will come back off an injury, no problem. It's, he'll be fine. But he's going to have to jump on a moving train again. And he's he's had a Vesna season for me. He's been that good. So you lose a top-tier player for two to four weeks – when you're in a dogfight down the stretch, let's see what the, this is adversity. Let's see yeah. what Vancouver has. Uh, you're right. Even if, if Vancouver holds on, which I think they can, they're a good team. Vegas, you know, hanging around. I mean, LA's not out of the woods there. LA's a good team. I think Vegas and LA are tied. It's just a matter of the games played and all of that. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but this is going to be very exciting that the sprint to the playoffs on both sides, but in the West, it's going to be a little bit more, you know, I, I think it, be more pronounced right near the end well and and that's the thing now like okay if vancouver was going to play vegas if edmonton catches them like you're still going to have to go through a good team in the first round that's and and maybe in the east it's a little bit different like you start mapping out like who's going to have to play who we the atlantic we kind of know we know you know like it's going to be florida boston toronto it seems like some kind of combination of that Philly's like, where does Philly go from here? Right? Like we're going to see Philly twice now in the next couple of weeks playing against Toronto. Like what does that team look like? Then the Islanders go on a six game heater at the yeah. same time that the Red Wings go on a five game skid after they just went on a six game heater. Like there's a little bit of a wiggle room there as far as who's going to be the last team in, in the East. Yeah. And, and like Tampa's only two points ahead of them and he, they've got less games. So Tampa's got to continue on. You're right. What's Philadelphia going to do? Um, you know, Torts got suspended. I kind of love, you know, I loved it. I don't know why. And I, listen, yeah. I'm a big ref guy and I think you need to show respect. But all he was, it seemed like all he was trying to get to do was the ref to come over and have a conversation. That's with all it is. You know what? Like I, I kind of, I'm with Torts on this. And I actually, I don't know how you guys felt about this, but if I'm like the coaches association, they have like the NHL coaches association. If I'm yeah. them, I'm probably putting notice out to the league that stop ejecting coaches from games. Like we're not going to let this turn into baseball where you hear one thing you don't like to the umpire and it's like you toss a guy from a game. Like Torts is, for, for whatever you think about Torts, he's a very well-respected coach. He's been around the league a long time. And I can guarantee you, if you went over to the bench and you talked to him, as much as he was animated and fired up, you could have defused that situation without having to throw him out. So I was there on Saturday. That was a 7 nothing drubbing of yes. the Flyers. They barely touched the puck in the first period. They were down 4 nothing. I believe, in the first nine minutes. That game was done, and Torts was having a meltdown on the bench before the whole incident that caused his ejection. And if you miss what happened, basically Torts refused to leave after Amazing. he was kicked out of the game. He's like, no, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. <laughs> Eventually he did. And I think there's two things with this. Number one, the refusal to leave the bench, the NHL and play it with the, I guess, kind of the, the overseers are trying to ensure that doesn't happen again. And coaches aren't disobeying the referees and holding up the game like Torts was doing, but also 
I'm sure you guys noticed the CEO of the Philadelphia Flyers came out and said, oh, we're covering torts is fine. Yeah. We're not going to uh, you know, take any money out of his pocket. We got this covered. And I'm sure Bettman's looking at that. It's like, oh, really? All right, well, you can't yeah. do anything about this. If you're going to pay the fine, we're just going to suspend him then. So it yeah. might have been a little bit of a costly preemptive measure by the Philadelphia Flyers CEO. Yeah, I saw that too, and I thought of that the same thing, AK, but my – my gut instinct is like Philadelphia is at a spot right now where they, I feel like torts is kind of that attitude is permeating right through the organization. It's like, we're going to do it our way. And if you don't like it to hell with it, we'll take the two games. You know, we've got capable staff. This is a team that we think is, is, is pretty good. A playoff, a playoff team. And to me, I, I, I don't mind it. They got a little bit of bite, and, and we'll see. Now, can they finish it off? Can they be a playoff team when none of us, I don't know how you guys chose, but I didn't pick them to be a playoff team. No way. No, no. So, I, I probably had them like in the, in that, because they said they were rebuilding. They said they were going to sell, sell off assets. Right. I kind of thought they would be near the bottom of the East, to be honest with you. Like, it, when, when a team has that kind of approach, you think they're going to be okay with being near the bottom of the standings, which is obviously very different than Ottawa Noodles, where those wow. guys are like, you know, we, we I think a, a lot of us were, were thinking that's a team that could be knocking on the door, and, and now it's like they can't win a game. They, they lost it again in, in San Jose on Saturday. I'm calling, I'm doing their games this week. I don't know what is going on. Like, you're watching <laughs> the games, and they're in them. You like the players, you like the group, you're like, okay, you know, this is good, this is good, and then all of a sudden it ends up like that's a loss. And you're like, how, like, you're almost like you're processing it going, how did it go from here to here? And you're right, like, bigger picture, guys, how did it go from here to here? At the start of the season, I think there was a lot of people going, okay, that's going to be a team that's going to be pulling points off of teams, uh, knocking at the door, either a playoff team or pretty darn close to it. And it's the other way. Like, they, they, now they've had such adversity, they almost feel, for me, that they're waiting for something nightly to happen. Bad, and then it happens. And right. it, whether it's you can't get a save, can't get a goal, get a bad call, get a bad break, all of these types of things. Bad, You know, like I just, I feel like that game in L.A. the other night we were just talking about where I jumped on the plane, they were in good shape. They played really well. I, I would argue that they were the better team for the first two periods. Then the third, L.A. kept chipping away. You knew they were going to have a push. And they just couldn't find a way. And then in the in overtime, you know, Fiala makes a good play, a little missed missed opportunity there by Stutzla, and it's in the back of the net. And there it is, game over. And it just seems like then you go into San Jose. That's where like that's a dagger. Yeah, that, that's what happened. Yes. Like Edmonton Oilers, like there were changes when they lost to to the to San Jose Sharks early in the season. Like the Sharks are the barometer, but right now, like. I don't know where Ottawa's at where they can go, well, we're a better team than you because they just haven't. You're only as good as you are in the standings, and unfortunately it's been a really poor season for the Sens. Mark Mathot will join us in about 15 minutes. He had a tweet earlier today, bring Eric Carlson home. So I guess that's what he's angling for in the offseason with the Ottawa know, Senators, man. his old D partner. Uh, with regards to the team here in Toronto, a 3-2 win over the Habs on Saturday night. No Mitch Marner. We'll get an update on him from Chris Johnson, our Hockey Insider, just after five. And I was looking at the records, the record for the Toronto Maple Leafs without Mitch Marner, without Austin Matthews, and without Morgan Riley. So we know the stats associated with Morgan Riley, 19-2-1 in the last two seasons without him. In his Maple Leafs tenure, without Marner, the Leafs are 14-13-4 and four without him, and 35-19-2 without Austin Matthews, which speaks to me that, you know, you're miss, missing Mitch Marner, obviously, it's a very costly endeavor. This guy's a very important member of the Toronto Maple Leafs. That goes without saying. But I did find it really interesting, the contrast between the Leafs' record without Marner and the Leafs' record without Matthews. For whatever reason, they do perform much better when Matthews is out of the lineup as opposed to Mitch Marner. Now, I'm not drawing any conclusions from that. It's just a very curious statistic that I struggled to explain. It's it is it is somewhat hard to explain. I guess it could be just coincidence. The the one thing that I kind of look at when when you see that stat is Marner affects so many different areas of the game. Like Matthews has been penalty killing this year, but prior to that, if you didn't have Marner in the lineup, you didn't have a guy who really possessed the puck at five on five and the guy who who was always looking to set up Austin Matthews. Like show me a good goal scorer 
and I'll show you a guy who's a who has a really good setup player, and Mitch Marner's yeah. that guy, and he's also he was he's always been such a big part of the penalty kill. So like not having Marner in the lineup is probably a bigger shock to the team. Um, and I guess that's probably indicative of the record. It's not to say that Matthews is less valuable to the team than Marner. It's just like Marner touches more parts of the game uh, than Matthews does on the team. You're right. I, just, I can't explain it because it's not like they're out for extended. Like neither one of these guys have been out for like months at a yeah. time. Like they've been a little pocket here, a little sickness there, a little, you know, tweaked wrist, whatever it was with Matthews. Like it was always just upper body type of thing. So it just happened to be kind of that's how the the chips unfolded. But I can't point to it. If, we, if we're looking at it, you're right. Like the way just Frankie explained it is maybe more touch points with Mitch. But Austin Matthews is a top tier player. He's yeah. one of the best on the planet. So losing him for any extra, you know, any game, whether it's one or ten, it's a huge blow. And the same thing with Marner. Now they've got some depth. We'll see other guys. It doesn't look like or sound like it's, you know, he's out for six weeks or something. It looks like a little tweak here or there. And they've got the luxury in the standings to not have to force feed him. Hey, we're chasing something. You know, you are chasing Boston and Florida. But ultimately, those two losses to Boston last week kind of, you know, it's an uphill climb now, right? Now are yeah. you eight? Am I, am I looking at that right, Joe? Uh, I think eight, nine eight, points eight, back. Nine points yeah. back. So, you know, it, it you can make sure that Marner's 100% for when it's critical and he can come back and play for you. Well, and now it's a good opportunity. Like, we saw Domi play the wing, and earlier on in the season, that looked like an area where he was struggling. They moved him to the center ice position, and he, he looked much better, looked more comfortable for him. I thought he was in the middle of the ice a little bit more, touching the puck a little bit more. But that game, like, he played the wing, and he looked really good. Like, I thought he really used his speed. He obviously created a nice chance on that on that breakaway where he's blowing the zone. I don't know. Like, I, I thought that was Domi's best game on the wing that we've seen him play all year. Well, I think it's going to be really interesting down the stretch here how the Maple Leafs, now this is the this is it. This is the final roster for the most part, what we're going to see from the Leafs over the last 18 games and kind of how they utilize certain guys in certain situations. And it doesn't look like Marner will be ready to play on Thursday against the Philadelphia Flyers. We'll wait and see about Carolina on Saturday, but this could be a couple games where you give the Matthews, Nylander, Bertuzzi top line another look. That's what Sheldon Keefe deployed to practice today. That trio did not look good at all against Montreal, and Keefe came out and said so. Really, it was the third line with David Camp, Matthew Nyes, and Bobby McMahon that really shone, and Keefe also identified that as something uh, that came together uh, really nicely, but I am curious to know your guys' thoughts on the D pairs that we saw on Saturday and the big controversy in the city regarding Simone Benoit being scratched in his hometown in Montreal in favor of Timothy Lilligren, a right-handed shot, which is in large part the reason that the coach identified the move was made in that the Leafs are a little bit thin on the right side. We know that's been a story. Yes, they bring in Ilya Labushkin. Yes, they bring in Joel Edmondson, who plays the left side. But scratching Benoit, keeping keeping Lilligren in the lineup, what was your reaction to that one, Frank? I thought, like, I, I, you can't compare this to, like, the Babcock-Spezza situation. I think this is, this is quite different. Like, this team needs Lilligren to be a right-handed shot who can be counted on at critical moments in key situations and play more of a prominent role for the team. So, obviously, like, they want to have him in the lineup. And with Edmondson coming in, like, it almost makes it seem like, like Benoit can be that guy who comes out at times. But I, I didn't, like, I don't I don't know, Noodles. I don't know how you read it. I didn't see it as, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to sit Benoit out if I'm Sheldon Keefe because I want to send a message or anything like that. Like, he needs Lilligren to play and play well. And, like, at the, it's just, it's the NHL. Like, it's, it is a business yeah. at the end of the day, and you have to put the roster that you think is going to help your team the best at that moment. And it's a numbers game, too. Uh, listen, let's just... Let's look at the left side, okay? Not withstanding. So the right side is what it is. And I know Benoit slotted on the right side. But let's just say they had three capable right-handed shots on the right side. Benoit's the fourth guy for me because he's not replacing Morgan Riley, not replacing McCabe. And Joel Edmondson is a cup winner. He's hard to play against. He's been there, done that. They brought him in to play in that third pairing. So realistically, 
Benoit would be your seven if the, the right side was trusted. And I'm saying that's a giant if. I know people point to, okay, Lilligren over Benoit. But if you're going left and right, like that's where, yes, Lilligren has to get his act together, bigger picture. Yeah. But if, if all's being said and they were starting the playoffs and the, the right side was solidified in the left, Benoit's seven. And, 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 I, and I know people are, are bullish with him. I think he's had a very good year. Keep in mind, at the start of the season, he was on waivers. This is a guy that was not slated to be on the team at the starting of the season. Now you bring in Edmondson, who, you know, is a longer player. I think they both play tough. I think they both play physical. And again, this isn't me to, to kick Simone Benier, Benoit, sorry, in the nuts. It's more about, like, this is where it looks like and how it's going to stack up. Now you, if Lilligren does not play well, and I think he's been rare, you know, very inconsistent, then you find the right side for Benoit. I, I think you yeah. find him. He's pushed his way into the lineup, and he deserves it. But that being said, like if, if it's all equal, I was fine with him coming out for a game and giving Edmondson that spot. Edmondson is the guy that you traded for, and for me, he's a better player than Benoit. It was That's just unfortunate. Like it was just unfortunate the timing because the game is in Montreal. So I think people look to that and say, like, why would you healthy scratch the guy? Yeah, but this but isn't you still Timbits. That's you, all you, it like, is, you exactly. Like, you still need a pu- I, I still think there's an element to Lilligren's game where it's like you put all those guys in on the back end, Labushkin, Edmondson, uh Benoit. You still need some guys that can move the puck, Jamie. Like you still need some guys that can have yes. a little bit of like, you know, can make some breakout passes that are maybe not the most elementary of plays. And like Lilligren, when he plays well, he moves the puck really well. So I think like that's part of keeping him in the lineup in a game like that. Like having that, having a guy who can run the second power play. So I thought it was made out to be a bigger deal than than it actually was. I think it just based is based around the fact that the game was in Montreal and Benoit is from there. But those are the the tougher decisions that a coaching staff needs to make sometimes. Yeah, I don't. I just I don't care so much if a guy's from there and it's like like you're trying to win games. This isn't you know participation badge and hey this guy's from there. And you're right. Like people pointing to the Spezza thing, that's ridiculous. The Spezza thing that was game one of the season. Like that was, yeah. it, you know, like that was, and it was against Ottawa. Exactly. That was derogatory. Like yeah. that was like calculated. It was ridiculous. This one yes. wasn't exactly. It's ridiculous. We all agree. I don't think it was disrespectful based on Montreal. I think it was more the fact that people were upset is that Ben was played really well. Why would he be the guy out? And that being said, and I respect that, it's more, it's a numbers game and they want to keep Lilligren. This is an opportunity for a young guy still to continue to get experience. And if they need a right handed shot who can move the puck, that's going to be your guy. So they're putting, I think it was a, a double shot. It, it looks bad for Benoit to come out, but it also saying to Lilligren, get your act together here because you know, you should be the guy coming out, but we're keeping you in so that you gain more experience here and play better down the stretch. Yeah, we saw Joel Edmondson play almost 20 minutes on Saturday night. He's clearly a key cog here going forward for the Leafs. The way that they want to play on the back end and kind of their lack of depth, the lack of style that they have with Joel Edmondson. Now he's a guy who can kind of maybe bring a different element that they didn't necessarily have before. Well, again, we'll talk to Mark Mathot in less than 10 minutes. Chris Johnston, TSN Hockey Insider, coming up just after 5 o'clock. We'll talk to Chris Rose from the NFL Network. Man, what a crazy day in the NFL. If you missed some of the stuff that's gone on already, the negotiation period has opened. Basically, legal tampering until yeah. <laughs> official official free agency opens at 4 o'clock on Wednesday. But, I mean, a number of guys have already committed to new franchises. Kirk Cousins will be an Atlanta Falcon this year. Saquon Barkley will be with the Philadelphia Eagles. We know that Russell Wilson headed into Pittsburgh. Tons to get to with Chris Rose from the NFL Network when he joins us just after 6 o'clock. Also, the Overdrive Oscars at 6.30. We'll be handing out some trophies of immense significance in our number three of the program. I'm Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes. That's Frank Corrado. That's Jamie Noodles McLennan. You're listening and watching to Overdrive here on TSN 2 and TSN 1050. Overdrive continues on this Monday afternoon. Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes. That's Frank Corrado. That's Jamie Noodles McLennan. Mark Mathot, TSN hockey analyst, will join us in just a moment. I did mention earlier I was down in Tampa. Pretty decent place to play hockey. Emily Arena, I could see why Braden Point and Stamkos and 
Andre Vasilevsky, Victor Hedman would take less money to play in Tampa Bay. It adds up, fellas. Yeah, you think? Yeah, you it, had a good it, time down there? It does. It is just, I mean, you walk to the rink in t a t-shirt and jeans, just gorgeous, gorgeous. I, I will say, I did see one thing that was really concerning on the kiss cam during oh, the yeah? game. Oh, no. There was a proposal, like a oh. marriage proposal in the kiss cam at a Lightning Flyers game. How would that have gone over for you guys in a similar situation? Mm-mm. Not good. <laughs> Not yeah, good. <laughs> I don't know. Especially, like, what if it's just a no guy? Like, what if it's just like, what if the girl's like, no, it's not happening, and you're just, you got to sit there and eat it in front of 20,000 people. Well, you like, can't just, do it in the kiss cam. No, it's got to be its that, own separate thing. Yes. Right? Like, it's got to be its own entity. You can't do it on the kiss cam. Let's find out what our next guest thinks about this. He is TSN hockey analyst, marriage connoisseur, and quality individual. It's Mark Mathot here on Overdrive. What's up, Mark? Uh, I'm not, not much, guys. Thanks for having me on. Always, always. So your thoughts on a marriage proposal during a kiss cam in Tampa Bay? Yeah, well, I heard Noodles mention Well, I heard you guys. I, got, I caught the tail end of it. Okay. I, uh, I'm torn on it. I think you're right. I don't think it's the time and place. It needs to be its own thing, probably organized uh, through the PR team. Maybe you have that conversation with somebody in the organization prior to the evening so that it's all set up randomly, maybe coming out of a timeout. I don't know, but a kiss cam... <laughs> And then, you know, <laughs> beyond that, like, you have to be damn sure she's going to say yes. Like, could you imagine? Yeah. Okay, well, you've, we've all seen the clips. They're so uncomfortable for me to watch that I, I like, I'll just keep swiping. Like, I, I can't watch the entire clip. <laughs> just when, as, just when someone as, gets neglected or turned down. It's, as it's cringe tough. as it gets. As cringe yeah. as it gets. I imagine there were some people, Mark, who were cringing at your tweet earlier today about Eric Which Carlson. One? <laughs> yeah, I guess there, there is a long list. The Eric Carlson coming home tweet. Can you take us yeah. through that and your rationale? You want to see Eric Carlson back with the Sens? Look, yeah, I mean, it's, it's wishful thinking, obviously. And I think we're at a point now um, where it, everyone's just desperate for a winner in Ottawa. And it's been a very frustrating season, I think, with... And I, I mean, I've been, I'm still having people tag me. There, there are still Toronto fans tagging me in the post that I made three years ago about how Ottawa would be a better team. And I think the anniversary of that date was like two days ago. So I've had a nonstop flood of Toronto fans just assaulting me in my mentions about that tweet. So it's been it's very, very eventful. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but so beyond that, with the Eric Carlson thing, I think I'm just trying to throw a bone to our fan base here. Uh, but, but there is a little bit of, like, there is a bit of reason behind it as well. Obviously, not ideal. Uh, a little bit of an older player, a huge cap hit. I understand all of that stuff. I'm thinking um, potentially here, and we, we, this, this has been floating around a little bit around Ottawa as far as maybe moving one of the core pieces. And when I say core pieces, you know, there's Jake Sanderson, Thomas Shabbat, Jacob Chikrin, a bunch of the forwards. We have options. And so, I mean, this guy just won a Norse trophy. I wouldn't say he's over the hill. I would argue that he's very comparable to Thomas Shabbat, but probably brings, brings infinitely more offense. Now, I'm sure Noodles, Frankie, they're probably shaking their heads, and I'm kind of shaking my head a little bit when I'm trying to make sense of this potential move. But you're going to bring in a highly motivated player. He still has his house here, his extended family's here, rather his, um, his in-laws all live here. So I don't know. I mean, for, for a franchise that struggles to bring in genuine rather legitimate free agents that, that are motivated to play in this market. Um, you know, when you can bring in a perennial all-star like Carlson, again, wishful thinking, um, I don't know why you would scoff at that. At least entertain the idea. Well, Frankie, I know you're going to, you got a question here, but just give me one second to retort to this. No, no, go for it. I got, <laughs> no, I got something on this too. No, I got I, something I, so on this I, I just, I, I listen, I, I don't think it'll work. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think it'll, whatever. No. But when I saw it, I thought to myself, and not just because I cover the sense, I'm like, if Kyle gets the green light to blow things up, you could ob- you could see that in Pittsburgh, he could be a guy that they would want to move. And keep in yeah. mind, that contract will be turned over a couple times, so you will, you'll be paying pennies on the dollar for Carlson. You're, you know, True. he wouldn't be a, a $12 million or $11.5 million defenseman financially. And there is a fit because, Matthew, you know, and Frankie, you guys know that when you look at Ottawa, 
The right side is something they are dying for for stability. Right shot defenseman. That's the problem. Like, you're circling the right. They've got a ton of left shots. When you've got Sanderson, Shabbat, Chikrin, um, Branstrand, the kid Clevin coming up, they're all left shots. The right side, Hammonick will be off the books. So now you're going to have Jacob Bernard Docker and Artem Zub. And pretty much, yeah. I'm, I'm, so yes, they do need a right shot defenseman. That's why they were bandied about, or at least in on a guy like Chris Tanev and guys like that at the deadline because you're thinking, okay, right shot, good leader, that type of stuff. So in a wishful thinking, I can agree with you, Matt. I, I really, I was like, okay. Maybe they could make that work again. Easier said than done. I don't even know they would cover that. So go ahead, Frankie. I'm no, sorry. My, like my my initial thought was would be to disagree with Meth. Like just my feelings around. I feel like once that that book closed on Carlson in Ottawa, I feel like it it was going to stay closed. But you played with the guy. Like you were his yeah. D partner. So I feel like you know a lot of people have opinions on things. But when you have such a close personal connection to him and you've you've been around him so long, there's a lot of validity. Um, to what you say about it so like who am I to you know to think that my opinion is right on that when you know him so well but it kind of brings us back to Pittsburgh doesn't it like Pittsburgh it's gotten ugly there very very quickly and and what do you do now like I I I think Kyle Dubas it, it can go one of two ways there for him his legacy could be the guy that drove Crosby out of town or it could yeah. be the guy that found a way to make things work there but it feels like that might even be a pipe dream so, I guess the way I would respond to that would be without having a like, galaxy brain this whole thing and just dumb it down. With Kyle Dubas, I know he took a ton of flack around the deadline. He moved cancel. That was a big deal. I remember seeing all the comments. People were angry. Which, I mean, typically speaking, when you move a... I don't want to call him a franchise player, but he's been, he's been a day one kind of guy. Numbers are great. Um, but I think what I would argue... Um, and, and, and why I think maybe it did make a little bit of sense. I mean, his contract's up. He obviously, or rather he, by, by he, I mean Dubas, clearly understands he's got an aging core in front of him, and I've been saying that for a couple years. I thought they did a little bit better last season than I kind of anticipated. This season, this is right where I just assumed they would be. I know with Crosby um, leading the pack there, and you still, got, you still have some, some, like I should say, I wouldn't say young pieces, but some older pieces that have great history and that have won, I don't know when you look around the NHL right now and all the teams that are seeing a lot of success, you need those young guns, those hungry, motivated, you know, high end 25 year old forwards. You need those players. I just, when I look at Pittsburgh right now, I see an old core and I see a lot of turnover happening over the next couple of seasons. So is it possible that Dubas is just identifying that and he's thinking, okay, I'm going to have to eat this one here and be the bad guy for a little bit, but I have to start, you know, shuffling some stuff. Around. The only thing I will add to that point is that if you're Sidney Crosby right now and you've got Kyle Dubas in the same room, does Dubas pretty much have to get on board with Crosby? I think the obvious answer is yes. So would Crosby have to okay on this? Like, do you sit him down as a captain? And I guess this is my question to you guys. How do you handle this? Because I know Noodles, you're probably thinking maybe, well, you know, if you're, you're, you're the general manager, you're not listening necessarily to any player. You're going to run your old program. You're going to make sure that you stick to your guns. But when you have a player like Crosby, you know, one of the best players of all time, you obviously have to hear him out. And if you're Sid, are you willing to go through some kind of weird retooling if you want to call it or a rebuild? Because I'm just, I'm just, guys, I'm just not seeing it moving forward. You've got Latang, he's getting older. You've got obviously Malkin, who looks much slower this season. I respect the heck out of him, by the way. But he's not necessarily the same player. Raquel's only got, I don't even think he has 10 goals. So you have to make changes. But does this all have to go through Crosby first? That's my question. I, I think it does, AK. I know you want to jump in too. I, I, I think it does. I also think the dynamic is very we- weird. There, you've got the Fenway Group, which has deep pockets. They brought in Kyle, but in the search process, Mike Sullivan was part of it. Yeah. And at some point, maybe Mike Sullivan isn't the coach anymore. It seems so bizarre, Jamie, that he would have been in on the process, right? Like, And all these other teams have fired their coaches, right? Like Edmonton. Now the Islanders yep. have fired their coach. They just rattled off five in a row. You would think, and we don't like, we're not going to, we're not calling for this to happen, but you would think that would be on the table, but it seems rather unlikely because he was a part of the hiring process for the guy that would ultimately be the one pulling the trigger. So that's why my answer, Beth, is it's very complicated because I think they all have to sit in the room with Sidney Crosby and go, this is the vision. Correct. 
This is what we're going to do. This is my plan. I've said this all along, and I could be 100% wrong, but I thought it was weird the term that Kyle signed. It was a seven-year deal, right? So for yeah. me, I felt like he, he basically said to them, for two years, I'm going to do patchwork with this group. I'm going to I'm going to add players, I'm going to spend money, I'm going to get shape the organization I want, but that's going to include Crosby, Malkin, Latang, you know, bring in Riley Smith, bring in EK65. I'm going to yeah. swing for the fences for 2 years. And if it doesn't work, I'm blowing it up and that's why I've got a 5-year deal on the back of this. That's and and that's going to take 5 years to retool. Again, I could be 100% wrong, but I thought the term of the deal Said, spoke more of like maybe the first two he's going to swing for the fences and try and yeah. you know keep this alive and then the final five is like okay I'm going to have to blow this thing up and rebuild scorched earth type of thing. So you had your experiment then you've done it it failed but you know kudos you tried you attempted to do it I, again like I said it's just like so how do you sit sit down right now at this point when he's still a, an effective player he's still a very good hockey player obviously. So right. at this point in his career, is he content moving forward throughout a rebuild? Like, like he's gonna, they're going to get pumped. You know what I mean? Every other night or so, there's going to be a couple bad games, and that's that's that that's demoralizing for a, for a, you know obviously a lock Hall of Famer, first ballot, you name it. Is he willing to do that? I, I just don't see it, and that's where things, as you mentioned, get so complicated. Because then you know his legacy will never be ruined. But why would like I just it doesn't seem right in him just jumping ship after he's already won you know, with the Penguins in the past. So it's like, you're not chasing a cup per se, but you also don't want to play on a loser. So, right. like, y- you can't convince Dubas to just maybe retool a little bit more here. I just don't see it. They have too many guys in that eight course I mentioned earlier that are there, and they're still sort of locked in. And, and I'm looking around the league, and it's like they're just behind the eight ball now, and that's the way I look at it. Mark Mathot is our guest, TSN hockey analyst. Meth, the Toronto Maple Leafs, their moves ahead of the deadline. They bring in Ilya Labushkin from Anaheim. Joel Edmondson yep. comes in. Connor Dewar from Minnesota. What was your evaluation of what Brad Tree Living did? Uh, and and he, another guy that took some heat, and I like the moves. I mean, they weren't blockbuster trade by any, by any means. It wasn't the shiny toy that was hanging out there that, that he wanted to go and grab. I thought he addressed what he needed to address. He brought in a little bit more sandpaper. I thought they needed that. I mean, Edmondson, I know some people were, were a little negative on him, perhaps, because um, he might not have the sexiest stat lines, maybe not the best analytical player. But that's not what you want. You want a third-pairing guy that's going to block shots with his face. He's going to cross-check everybody at net front within the rules, of course. And he's going to do all these things, all, all those little dirty areas that maybe Toronto has lacked in over the last you know, X amount of years which, by the way, wasn't working. So, I mean, the argument that you should bring in somebody else or other types of players, that failed miserably. So, Trilliving comes in, you bring in guys like Bertuzzi, Domi. Now you made a couple more adjustments here at the trade deadline. I love it. I think it's great. I would love nothing more than to come on right now and just take a big dump all over the team. because <laughs> It attracts attention, and everyone's going to attack me, and it's like kind of this little game that I play on. Tw- you know, but, but, but I'm being honest here. Like, I love these moves. Um, Dewar's going to help. He should help the penalty kill. And as I mentioned, Edmonton's going to add a little bit of grip, shot blocking. He's a, he's a proven winner in the past. He's been there. So that's the element that I always kind of bang on here. Um, when we talk about with Edmonton, just as an example, he's been there and done that, meaning he's not going to be that nervous when the playoffs start. He's not going to be all tight, gripping his stick. He's been there. He's done that. He's experienced. He's had a couple long runs. He's going to be a calming uh, presence in the locker room. He's intense on the ice when he didn't want him to be. He's still going to make mistakes. He's still going to probably turn over the odd puck here and there when he goes to get the, those retrievals in the corners. But that's okay. You can live with those areas. It's the deterrence that he brings to the table, coupled with the fact that you can actually play him. I know I mentioned being a deterrence, guys like Reeves, when he was acquired. Those are great during the regular season, depending on the lineup that you're playing against. But you might not get, he might not be that effective in the postseason. But you can live with that. Players like Edmondson kind of carry that into the postseason. He's another threat. So if you think you're going to take a liberty on a player, oh boy, now I've got to deal with that guy. So those are the kind of ways that I look at it. When you play in those long rounds, it's a grind, it's physical. There's a lot of intimidation involved, whether people want to admit that or not. It's there. Those are the mind games. So, um, you know, I think you, you insulate guys like Marner and Matthews with all these players. It takes a little bit of pressure off of them. And, I really think this just adds a little bit more swagger and bite now 
to the Leafs lineup. Meth, what do you think of the mind games that Kelly McCrimmon and the Vegas Golden Knights <laughs> seem to be playing with the league as far as their moves ahead of the deadline? Hey, listen, like you listen. know it, you were there, like you know these guys firsthand. Yeah, well, I was their first draft pick. Well, I don't know if I was the first one. But I don't know. I forget now the whole. It was a bit of an orchestra, but when I was obviously plucked from Ottawa, they brought me in there. I never, never stepped foot in Vegas as a Golden Knight. I was traded to Dallas, but I can still remember the conversation I had with Kelly McCrimmon right, right after I was picked. There was zero interest in how I was doing or where I was planning on going or that there was excitement that I was coming to Vegas. Almost immediately, it was... Uh, are you still pretty firm on that 10-team no-trade list that you have right now? All they cared about were the teams that are on my list clearly wanted to move me immediately, and that kind of leads me to my point. They're ruthless, and they want to win, and they win at all costs. And I think, um, you know, I'm sure you guys have spoken about this ad nauseum already, so I don't want to be too repetitive, but, um, you know, they're, 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 they're in win-now mode. They're desperate. They were desperate, rather, for a few changes. They've kind of struggled a little bit by their standards since, like, the end of December. So they've had to make a bit of a splash, and they made a huge one. I mean, you've got Stone on the LTIR there with the lacerated spleen. So I can understand that some people might look at that and think it's a little weird. But you bring in Hurdle. You bring in Manta, a really good two-way forward, 50% retention. Then you've got Hannafin, a top defenseman, right on your top pairing with Angelo. I mean, it's almost unfair. And then... So my only question, I guess, would be, or concern, is what happens now when Mark Stone potentially strolls back into the arena prior to game one? I mean, like, what message does that send to the rest of the league, or at least the GMs, you know? So I know Vegas isn't concerned about it, but, I mean, this could be a league issue moving forward. And I'm not questioning the integrity of some of these players that are on the LTIR. They very well be, they very well be hurt, like may be hurt, right? And I can accept that. It just, from an optics point of view, it looks a little suspect. Yeah, well, it also works on both sides, right? You consider what Vegas is doing with the LTIR, burying guys until the playoffs. At least that's what's happened. Yeah. And with, think about Nikita Kucherov and Patrick Kane in the past, the same applies. Then you consider on the other side of the spectrum what Arizona has done over the years. Yeah, Chris Pronger and Mary and Hosa yeah. and <laughs> Pavel Dadov, whoever else they've they've they plucked True. in. And Clarkson, put on, yeah, like, like yeah. I mean, it, it works both ways. I I would rather personally. The intrigue and interest that Vegas has created with their LTIR maneuvering as opposed to the other side where you're just really manipulating the salary cap in more of a negative way. Yeah, no, you're right. This is exactly. And, and I mean, beyond those, which, by the way, those are great points, AK. And, and I would also say, I mean, they're becoming, they're just, be, they're becoming, you know, the envy of the league and at the same time the villain, right? And I think. For me, it's like they're just trying to win games. And that's sort of my takeaway, despite how they're doing it, perhaps. And maybe they're a little cutthroat about the whole thing. But, but I mean, it's, it's entertaining, and we're talking about it. And um, they've got an absolute wagon of a team when they are healthy. So I think, for, I think at the, in the end, um, you know, <laughs> on a healthy squad for the Golden Knights, what are they looking at, like $135 or $140 million salary cap on that team? But I think in the end, I, it, it's, it's good for the game to a degree. It's great because, you know, you've already kind of brought in now this, this successful um, group in Vegas, so you've got a full house every game. People are bought into the team now, which is great. You hope that you don't avoid that dip in attendance over the next X amount of years when maybe they do go through a rebuild. But in the end, it, the game's about winning, and you got to hand it to McCrimmon. He's got his eye on the prize right now. Matt, thank you for doing this. We'll let you get back to your Twitter battles. Appreciate it. Oh, all right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank that's you. our man, Mark <laughs> Mathot, TSN hockey analyst. I was actually looking at Cap Friendly this morning, and it's the Leafs who have the highest yeah, 100 cap million. space. Exactly. 100 Remember, million. they have Matt Murray on LTIR. They Jake have Muzzin, Muzzin on LTIR. Yeah. It's so funny you John say Klingberg that, on LTIR. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny you say that because I think at Trade Center, we're all just you know going, oh my God, oh my God. And somebody like tweeted at, you know, I think Trade Center or TSN going, you guys live in Toronto. Mm-hmm. They created Robida Island. They legitimately created Robida Island and have people disappear there yeah. left and right. They're like, and you're yelling at Vegas? Literally, when, when if you look at it, go to Cap Friendly. It's $100 million they're spending this year. Like In theory, the Leafs could be like, hey, John Tavares, like, we're going to put you on LTIR until game one. Like that could, like, The Leafs could do that. And I'm not saying that Vegas is doing all these nefarious activities. Like I truly believe Mark Stone is hurt. Alec Martinez is hurt. Thomas Hurdle's hurt. These guys aren't on the IR. But, you know, 
I could, you know, there's different ways to go about doing things. And the Leafs have basically started this whole thing many years right. ago with Lamorello. So, I mean, what Vegas does, and I thought Meth laid it out perfectly, completely cutthroat. And they don't care about anything. They trade, they, I think they've traded like 80% of their first round picks since they've been in existence. Yeah. So, like, kudos to them and what they're doing clearly works. And that is not a team anybody wants to see come the playoffs. Should no. they make it? They still got to get in, but it looks quite positive. We'll talk to Chris Johnston, our hockey insider, in about 15 minutes. Something to chew on still to come in the first hour of Overdrive here on TSN2 and TSN 1050. Every weekday here on Overdrive, we announce a current or former Maple Leaf Player of the Week. And on Friday, you'll have the chance to call in and name all five players in the lineup. If you name them all, You'll win a pair of tickets to see the Maple Leafs and the Oilers on March 23rd. Probably the game of the year. Regular season game of the year. Anytime McDavid and Dreisaitl come to town. Today's Leafs lineup player is William Lagason. William Lagason. We hardly knew him. Hardly knew him. Yeah. Claimed by the Anaheim Ducks. <laughs> Been a, it was a good run. It was a good run. Hell of a run. William Hell Lagos. of a leaf. Most, alumni coat. Most Head of an alumni jet. Hey, he qualifies. He does. That's legit. He qualifies. I certainly yeah. agree. Hour two of Overdrive coming up. We have Chris Johnston and Keegan Matheson. Lots of good stuff till to come. Still to come here on the show.